Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I am Lindy Ruano, and I am with Easter Sales of Southern California and the Disability Tribe Initiative. Today's webinar, Change Management Strategies for Disability Services to Tribe, is offering ASL and Spanish interpretation. Next slide, please. Para las personas que necesitan o prefieren el español, pueden hacer clic en el icono con el globo blanco en la parte baja de su pantalla, que dice Interpretation. Después, haga clic en Spanish. Usted tendrá la opción de silenciar el audio original y podrá escuchar la voz de Mark Gutiérrez traduciendo en vivo. En el canal de español, si selecciona Mute Original Audio, Nada más escuchará al intérprete. Si no hace clic en Mute Original Audio, entonces escuchará a los presentadores de habla inglés al fondo. Our ASL interpreters are Betty and Destiny. They have been spotlighted so they can always be seen throughout the presentation. Depending on your device, this may mean that sometimes you cannot see the presenters. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we want to make sure that this live meeting and the recording can be accessible to everyone. This presentation will have closed captioning, which you can access by using the button at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. A few things to note about Zoom before we get started. This meeting is being recorded to allow us to refer back to the discussion today and the input we receive. You can hear and see us, but we cannot hear and see you. Everyone has been automatically put on mute and your camera is not on. Chat is not activated for attendees. However, presenters will be sharing some information through the chat during the webinar. If you would like to ask questions or provide a comment, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you indicate which presenter you would like to send a question to. We do have staff monitoring and responding as necessary. Some questions will be answered in real time. Some will be saved for the live Q&A at the end, or we may ask you for an email address so we can follow up with a more through answer after the webinar. Today, we will be having polls. We encourage you to participate and provide your input. For those of you on a phone or a device, you may not be able to use all the features we discussed. We will be providing other options for you to access material or ask questions later in the webinar. Finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will be asking you to participate in a post-event post survey. Once the webinar is over, a new window will pop open with the survey. Please provide your feedback so we can improve on future events. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Barry Giardini, Executive Director of the California Disability Services Association. Barry? Thank you so much, Lindy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So glad to be with you today and welcome to the latest installment of the Disability Thrives webinar series. Uh, and as Lenny mentioned, today's webinar is on change management strategies for disability services to thrive. Um, obviously, we are, a, we are an initiative that is focused on organizational change and service delivery uh, change as the alternative services models came in. And we're really excited about the program today because we have got a couple of experts on here who are going to walk you through kind of big picture organizational change, how to plan for that, how to adapt to that change, prepare yourself, your team, and really try to make the best of, of change. Um, so without further ado, I am going to introduce today's presenters. Um, we are very lucky and fortunate to have uh, two presenters with a vast experience in change management. Uh, the first is Brian Nider, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Ability Path, which is one of the largest community-based organizations serving the needs of individuals with developmental disabilities in the greater Bay Area. 
Uh, but prior to joining Ability Path in 2015, Brian was a senior vice president for electronic arts, um, spending over 26 years with electronic arts in overseeing initiatives focused on improving EA's business practices, product development cycle mergers and acquisitions, and other change management initiatives. Um, he also serves on several nonprofit boards and is the founding board member of the Santa Clara University Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and is a member of the Board of Regents. Um, so clearly he's got a lot of uh, a lot of experience in change management. We're super excited that he's here today. Um, but first, the first presenter today is going to be Jennifer Holk, who works at the Monitor Institute of Deloitte, which is a social impact and consultancy think tank uh, that sits within a globally recognized professional services firm. Uh, Jennifer works at the intersection of strategy, scenario planning, and social impact. Um, and at heart, Jennifer is a storyteller who helps people and organizations move from ideas to action. She's offered, authored a number of publications um, which help uh, organizations plan for the world on the other side of COVID-19. Prior to her work at the Institute, she also worked for Teach for America, worked as the Director of Teacher Leadership uh, Development, and where she coached teachers on instructional best practices and leadership. So a lot of that's changed as well. She has a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and uh, is, is just a pleasure to have her here today. So first I will um, introduce Jennifer Hulk and kick it over to you to start the program. Great, and thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It is always odd to hear someone talk about you, and I am just so thrilled to be here today. If you could go to the next page. Um, we're, today we're going to be talking about a, a few different pieces. The, the big picture that I hope you are able to take away from this conversation is to think about preparing for the new or the next normal, no matter what that future might look like. And, and we'll talk about some tools to, to help you do that. And as part of that process, my, my friend and colleague, Brian, is going to talk about his experience managing the incredible amount of change that we have all navigated over the past, I guess, 18 months now. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to start off by sharing a little bit about our work and how we think about planning for the future when it's uncertain. And then I hope that we'll get into a really good conversation with all of you. I know the questions are, are my favorite part of this. On the next page, um, you'll, you'll see a quote and it says, we're all facing the same storm but we're not all in the same boat. Some of us are in duct taped rafts and others are in reinforced cruiser ships and there's really no comparing the vessels. That was from Tulane Montgomery who works at the venture philanthropy firm, New Profit. And she was one of the over 80 interviewees that we had as part of our work in the midst of COVID to figure out how can we help the social sector plan when so much is uncertain and so much is unknown? And over the course of, of our work and research on that topic, we spoke with over 80 different social sector leaders like Tulane who were really trying to manage and, and navigate in the midst of this unprecedented uncertainty. And we did that so that we could do what we call scenario planning. And scenario planning is really just a structured way of thinking about the future. And over the course of our conversations um, on the next page, we, we heard all sorts of different ideas about the most important um, challenges that the social sector needed to wrestle with. Mario Moreno, who launched the Venture Philanthropy Partners said, we're now dealing with three crises at the same time, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and a social justice crisis. And since that conversation, we've also heard that we should add an environmental crisis, an education crisis, a mental health crisis, and many more to that list. But for us in our work, it's really about understanding how all those different pieces interact and compound with one another um, in order to think about and plan for the future. And so on the, the next page, 
for those of you that aren't familiar, I do want to take a minute and, and say, well, gosh, what is this scenario planning work that you're talking about? What does scenario planning mean? Um, and it's a structured way of thinking about the future. It, it's rooted in this idea that even in the best of times, we can't accurately anticipate what's going to come ahead. No one can predict the future. But what we can do is imagine multiple possible pictures of how the future might play out and, and rehearse or practice how we might respond um, if those futures come about. Most of the time, all of us and all of our organizations operate with an official or an expected future. And you see that described on the left-hand side of the screen. At best, organizations do financial contingency planning where we plan for a best case year, a medium year, and worst case scenario. That's important. But the disruption that we've all experienced is more than just financial. It, it gets at the very core of, of who we are and, and how we serve our communities. And so in our work, we really wanted to challenge some of the basic assumptions about what the future could look like. And since we don't know how will it will unfold, even in the best of times, uh, doing that over the past 15 months was an adventure. So, so to go through that process, on the next page, um, you'll see that we have some what we call prudent assumptions. These are the things that we could hold on to even in the midst of this uncertainty because scenario planning really revolves around two things. What do we know? What can we assume? And what don't we know? And so it's worth noting that COVID has turned many of the things that we thought we knew on their head. Um, who knew that people could pivot to virtual programming practically overnight, that you could tell me that my children won't be in school tomorrow and I will just accept that as a reality. Um, th these are underpinnings that, that have really been challenged. And so in trying to understand the future, we landed on five baseline realities that we thought we could lean on in over the past year and a half and looking ahead. Number one, the pandemic is going to intersect with and compound other ongoing trends. This crisis has accelerated many changes that were already underway in society. And it's also widening many of the fissures and flaws in our systems. We see that as a former special education teacher, we see that particularly when it comes to, to support for our students with special needs um, and with people with longstanding health needs. Um, COVID is no longer just the, the lead story, but it's the supporting story for almost everything else that's happening right now. Um, racial justice protests are happening with the context of masks and social distancing. Um, it's important to understand that, that this experience we've had over the last year it is not going to go away anytime soon, but it is going to, to change some of those trends. The second is that the need for nonprofit services will dwarf available capacity and resources. Even if the pandemic ended tomorrow, we would still be facing massive resource gaps and dealing with the fallout over the last several months and years. Organizations are going to face real limits to their capacity about whose needs get prioritized and what services they provide. Third, we we wanted people to wrestle with the idea that nonprofits, some may be forced to consolidate or close their doors. We don't know by how much yet, but early estimates of the contraction range anywhere from 10 to as high as 40%. Um, and it's important for both nonprofits and funders to recognize that that's the reality that we'll be living with over the coming several years. Fourth, the impact of the crisis has fallen disproportionately on communities of color and other marginalized populations. As I said, COVID has been exacerbated many existing inequities. And so without active intervention, 
our communities will come out with even wider inequalities than what we started with. And finally, the differences in outbreak rates and reopening strategies across different geographies will really matter. Um, so how people in the Bay Area are experiencing this crisis is very different than where I am in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and, and we have to recognize that people will need different things as we approach the next normal, depending on where they've been and what their experience has looked like over the last year. So those were the certainties. And from there, we had to take this and look at the uncertainties. That list is about a mile long. Um, but on the next page, what we tried to do was narrow down from all of the things we didn't know to the two most critical ideas. The two that we chose we thought would be both useful and meaningful for the social sector and would paint really vivid pictures about how the world could look. And in doing this, we hope to be both provocative but also helpful for your organization. So the first uncertainty is the severity of the crisis. And by this, we mean both the long-term viral and health impacts of the crisis, but also the severity of the economic crisis. Basically here, we want to know what is the level of state of emergency in our community? And then for the next axis, we chose social cooperation. Essentially, can people come together enough to act collectively? Do we see stagnation and fracturing as is shown on the left-hand side of the screen or action and cooperation as is described on the right-hand side? Now, we certainly don't expect that suddenly everyone will put aside their long-standing differences and all agree on all of the issues. But the idea here is, is whether or not we can act out of a shared sense of collective responsibility looking forward into the years ahead. And so well, what I'd love to do here now is, is pause. And as you think about these different uncertainties, we want to get your quick pulse with a poll that's on the next page. And, and what we want to know is, what do you believe with all of the uncertainty is, are some of your biggest barriers to change? Is it about technology, staffing and teams, um, finances or, or resource constraints, um, stakeholder buy-in, kind of thinking about the change management, um, having time or something else? Take maybe 30 seconds or so to, to think about what you believe your biggest barrier is. And I will defer to the people behind the screen. Um, it looks like a, a bunch of responses are still flowing in. So we'll give people another 20 seconds or so. Okay. I think I think we have a few more answers still coming in, but maybe we'll cut it off in about 10 seconds to take a look at the results. Okay. Ah. So what's interesting to me here is that you all are, are pretty spread out um, and, and that staffing or, or personnel is, is really important um, as well as the financial constraints. And, and that really mirrors what we heard as being uh, two of the most critical barriers to change. 
basically, is our staff going to be willing to stick with us if we need to live in this hybrid environment for the long term? And are our funders going to stick with us? Um, those are really big and important questions. And so what we aimed to do was to take some of those big questions and create possible futures about how the world could play out so that you could plan for those big barriers to change. And on the next page, we don't have time to get into the full details of, of all of the scenarios. Um, but what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a, of a flavor for what we developed. And we can certainly share the full report. Um, to develop these scenarios, what we did was cross the two axes, the level of severity of the crisis and the level of social cooperation. And then we asked ourselves, what would the world look like if we lived in these different spaces, in these different quadrants? So in the first, in the upper left-hand side, we asked, what would it look like, for example, if the country came together and the impact of the crisis was less painful or less long-term than many people initially thought. And there in scenario one, we see this pull back to the way things were, this return to normal. But that's not all rosy because for many, that could undermine the opportunity to address many of the inequities that have been unveiled and made worse by the crisis. And we could certainly see this playing out given the, how quickly the, the vaccine has been rolled out in the US relative to, to the global community. Um, and we've already seen a lot of the getting back to normal um, activities begin to pick up. Then in the bottom left, we asked ourselves what it would look like if the severity of the crisis was still lower than many expected, but we really struggle to come together as a country. And in that future, we could imagine divisions deepening and widening with surprisingly little reform being accomplished because we can't agree on what to fix or on how to fix it. And this certainly feels feasible given um, how, how some of the vaccine rollout has, has taken place, but there's also a level of hesitancy with, with adoption. Um, and we've also seen staggering levels of, of polarization and partisanship that have really been unrivaled in the modern era that, that are testing that social fabric. In the bottom right, um, and with this one, I tell folks, maybe you want to take a deep breath for this one. Um, in a world where both the crisis is more severe than many expected, and we really struggle to come together, things can get worse at an alarming rate. For the first time in a century, hunger isn't just present, but it overwhelms many communities. And with a social safety net that has large and growing holes, nonprofits and funders are faced with a new level of the scarcity mindset. They're trying to provide, but really ill-equipped to meet the astonishing need that communities have. And while this feels less likely, it's certainly still possible if those fractures and divisions in our society continue to grow worse and we were to see a resurgence of the virus that caused another round of lockdowns or perhaps was vaccine resistant, you could imagine that, that people very quickly are, are quite fed up and that that could have really negative long-term consequences for how we all work together. So finally, um, what happens if the impact of the crisis is high and we find ways to come together? This is scenario four, rising from the ashes. History is filled with examples of people coming together in the face of really overwhelming challenge. We describe this as rising from the ashes. There's no denying the, the long-term and harmful effects if the crisis is very severe. But it's that pain and challenge that allows people to push aside really long-standing differences and work together towards 
significant and even structural changes. With this one, we say there is light at the end of the tunnel, but the pathway to get there is long. And we can certainly see this playing out. We've already seen some significant progress in certain pockets or geographies where state and local governments are making meaningful changes to how they support people and what the social safety net looks like. We're seeing communities come together to, to say, what can we learn from the pandemic and how will we move forward and look ahead? Um, so what do you do with these all of these scenarios? Um, how, how do you take them forward? Uh, on the next page, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the applications. Um, and, and then I'd love to pass it over to Brian to talk about his experience um, doing change management throughout this process. The first thing that I would say is that you have to make scenarios that, that are your own. So perhaps taking what we've written about and building on it to make sure that it fits the particular needs of your organization, whether that be thinking about the finances as as some of, of around 25% of you mentioned, or thinking about your staffing needs or stakeholders, but how are you adjusting these to say, what's most important for our organization? And just as important is to find your anchors and to have real clarity around your core beliefs and values. I know many of the education organizations that I work with fundamentally changed their model, whether it be through geography or who they were serving over the course of the pandemic, but they had to hold tight to what their core beliefs were so that they didn't go off and, and become, for example, a food service organization in the midst of, of the need to support hungry families because that wasn't their, their core value. That wasn't their core skill set for the community. And then third, we want to ask people to test your current strategy against each scenario. So if we experience a social fabric unraveled, how will my plans for the next year play out? What would I need to change or adapt? And ask those tough questions. And finally, develop a plan for the next 12 to 18 months. So often we make three and five year strategic plans that that doesn't feel prudent in this moment. Um, but thinking about the next year and, and breaking it out into three or six month increments to say, hey, we're going to stay virtual for the next three months, but we're going to revisit it at that time. And staff, we promise to give you 30 days notice to get your childcare lined up before we require you to come back full time into the office. Being able to make those kind of incremental steps and plans can be really helpful, both for your organization, but, but also for your staff to know there's a lot that's uncertain, but here's what I can rely on from my organization or from my team. And, and doing that has been really helpful for many of the organizations that we have spoken with. Um, so with that, I, I'm going to pause. I think we're going to go two pages ahead uh, and I'm gonna pass it off to Brian to talk about um, his experience planning in the midst of this crisis. All right. Camera is off, but the video is on, so I'm starting my video. Uh, first of all, Jen, thank you for the overview of scenario planning. Uh, Jen and uh, Carrie Fulmer from uh, Monitor uh, came in and actually ran three working sessions for our organization with all of our managers. Uh, and that happened in January and February of this year as we started to look to a post-pandemic world. And what I will say right up front is part of it was a socialize and getting managers involved in thinking about change. So it was less of an event and more of a process. And, uh, you know, this quote from former President uh, Barack Obama, I think kind of resonates with a lot of what we try to instill in our team. And we've been working on for multiple years is change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. 
We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. That it felt a lot of times that people were more feeling a little bit like victims. You know, we, we are, we've had chronic underfunding for a long time. In trying to step out of that and think about what we can do to move things forward in a positive direction. And I would say that that work over a couple of years really culminated with uh, Jen and her team going through scenario planning for us and how we imagine the future. So I'll go to the next slide, please. So very similar to the, uh, the process that Jen went through on scenario planning, some things for consideration as you get ready to initiate any sort of change initi initiative. You know, whether or not you're modifying how you do your, your programs, putting in a new financial system, whatever it might be, you need to really have a balancing act between the current demands on your team and what you think the better future is going to look like. And those are trade-offs that you need to weigh. And I talk a little bit about that uh, in a future slide. You wanna communicate the why the change is being undertaken and you wanna be able to engage people at an emotional level. Um, and, and this is absolutely critical. You have to paint a picture of why this hard work is going to happen and make sure that there is buy-in in working with people to hear about their concerns and fears and help move them forward in the project. Be prepared for setbacks and resistance. It's going to happen. You can count on it. Uh, it sure as the day is gonna to start tomorrow. Uh, don't get discouraged. You go back to remembering the original vision of what you're hoping to accomplish and don't let those setbacks resistance slow you down from the desire to improve uh, the whatever the initiative might be. Along the journey, make sure you celebrate wins often and share praise and uh, uh, for your team very, very liberally. You wanna to continue to communicate the vision and progress along the way. Ultimately, the goal with anything is to start making change a core value of your organization and a strength of your organization and uh, team's culture. Because the reality is, if you think back where we were a year ago, we were wrestling with what is the pandemic gonna look like? Where is funding gonna be? How are we gonna deliver programs? And here we are a year later, it's sort of the other end of the spectrum. How are we gonna go back to in-person services? You know, what's the future funding model gonna like? So guess it look like, so we still have a lot of change, but I think building the uh, muscle strength and organizational strength so people can be focused on how to manage it rather than feeling like they're having to react, it's a very different proposition. Next slide, please, thank you. So a quick poll, you know, click in on where you think your organization's readiness is. Are they prepared and ready for, for change? I need the Jeopardy countdown music. Give it a minute for everybody to fill in where your organization is at in your readiness to manage a change initiative or just generally being able to adjust and adapt to change. All right, 20 seconds. The countdown, T minus probably about 10 seconds. Here we go. Like Regis Philbin and the survey says, 42% are yes, only 12% are no, and not quite half are sort of in the middle, not sure exactly, somewhat ready. That's great. We'll go to the next slide. So the critical axes of change. So the, what you wanna measure here when you start an initiative and start thinking about the change program that you have that you wanna implement, you sort of weigh the first one between where's your team at and being able to manage change and kind of where's the payback for the organization or the folks that we serve, where's that in the mix? So from one end, it's going to be uh, 
very risky change and the team is, I need to fix that typo, averse to change. The other one's being very adept at change and there's going to be a bigger payback. So when you go through these, you can see here on the, the slide, some of the things I've put in for consideration and I need my glasses for that. You know, the first thing is change is unsettling. It is very personal. Recognize that up front. Organizations have what I would describe as tensile strength. You know, are they going to break or are they going to bend? And depending on how drastic the change is you want to implement, you want to make sure you know where your team health is at before you get started. As you move forward, you want to continue to engage the team to provide and share their ideas to take authorship and ownership of the direction that you want to go. So you're empowering a team to make change happen. Uh, you don't want to be just command and control in the long run. That does not serve any organization well. You want people to be engaged and have a uh, part of the process and have a hand in crafting the future. The next one is what is the benefit to our mission? So obviously very low payback and maybe a necessary change and one that has a huge payback. This could be you know, adjusting to HCBS requirements, having a radical change to the program design to make sure that that is implemented. So in any event, you sometimes wanna start small to build the practice to kind of see how the team and how your uh, managers are able to, to wade through that. And then when embarking on a major change, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're visible and open for feedback and to provide that feedback, communicating clearly and often about why and repeating it so folks can be able to be heard if they have issues or questions, but also if they have suggestions. So before you embark, you want to make sure you kind of weigh these in your own mind about how to manage forward. Next slide, please. Kicking off a change initiative. So the first one is easy win. The next one is sort of in the lower quadrant, kind of asking, is this really necessary? The third one working our way up is, what's the opportunity cost for this change? Time and resources from my team versus the payback of the initiative. And the fourth one is going big with a very large change. So I'd always recommend for organizations that are maybe in the somewhat phrase phase to test the waters with an easy win. You know, it's high organizational impact for the change with limited disruption. It can be a nice win for the team and actually build confidence to try more challenging change initiatives. The asking why category is a lower impact to the organization. You know, it might be something that needs to be implemented, but it really is something that should probably be considered part of a um, operational goal, something that somebody should be assigned to versus being kind of an organization change. The third one, what's the opportunity cost? This is a complex change initiative with high payback, but it could mean that the expense in terms of time and effort, not just dollars, could be significant because it's taking away from other important priorities for your team and you don't want to burn them out. The last one is the very big, very vocal, very visible change initiative that's going to be transformative for your organization. By the way, I just want to mention in all of these, you want to have communication with the community that we serve. So whether or not that's participants, caregivers, whoever it might be, it could be donors, it could be uh, elected officials in your local area that have an interest in your agency. You want to keep people posted on the things that you're working on that are going to impact the community. A lot of times they have ideas that are very helpful or they can provide resources that are going to benefit you. And I'm going to talk about one of those ideas that we kicked off a while ago that had uh, support from somewhere that wasn't expected. So again, easy win, asking why, check the opportunity cost, and then go big. Next slide, please. So change is a mindset and a skill that can be learned. It, uh, it doesn't come naturally to anyone, but as you build up and practice, uh, organizations and all of us individually can be more adept at managing change and understanding how to manage through it. As I mentioned earlier, you want to start with the why and engage the heart. You need to take the time to paint a picture in your own mind's eye about where you want your team to be, how you want the programs to be better, how it's going to make the lives of those we serve better. And you don't want to lose focus on that because there's going to be a lot of noise when you start making a change to get to that endpoint. And I think that the mission that we all have is so noble and so significant 
that I think anytime you're working to make a change to improve the lives of those that we serve, it's hard to argue with that. What you want people to do is to provide input and how to the why, or I should say the how to get there to make that how much easier to navigate. So the next thing is developing the team's ability to manage through change. This takes a lot of time of listening, communicating, soliciting feedback. Some people may not be as vocal. You wanna solicit their feedback on the change that you're working on because a lot of times they will have ideas and or maybe more reluctant to share an idea because they think maybe it's too crazy or just a little bit out there, but you wanna make sure you get feedback from your entire team. By the way, this applies to large and small organizations. This isn't just for big organizations. This is relevant for organizations of any size. Next is to persevere, adjust and adapt along, along the way. There will be a lot of surprises that pop up. How you adapt to those, those surprises is critical because you need to navigate through them every day. We all do with the jobs that we have. And in a change initiative, it's no different. Persevere, stay focused on the end goal and adjust along the way. And as I mentioned before, celebrate the wins often and early and reinforce the positive work your team's doing. And when there's a coaching opportunity about how to navigate something a little bit better, be sure to share that too, because that is in a way learning and winning as well so that we can get better uh, as we move forward. Next slide. So some innovation projects, excuse me, about four years ago, um, brought in some folks to help do for, for our adult programs uh, to set up four working groups to have an innovation idea around a social enterprise. And uh, this is the left, one up in the left corner called Grins and Giggles. They were broken into four different teams. They had a lot of amazing ideas. We had multiple workshops. The teams then broke into working groups over several months to build a business plan around that and put together the thinking about an idea that they thought we should consider to improve programs and our ideas about the future and what we do. I will tell you, I think there are a lot of eyes rolling when we first started, people were skeptical. Is this for real? Is it a waste of time? What are we gonna do with it? Which is all understandable. No one had ever been asked to do that before. The ideas the teams came up with, because they had to present each one of the projects, the team had to present it to the executive team and some of the board members. And the idea we have on here, by the way, they were all very, very good. The one that we ended up selecting, Grins and Giggles, was taking advantage of one of the playgrounds and preschools we have, where we had a weekend birthday party, party celebration that was sensory sensitive, tailored for families with special needs children. And we went out and marketed it. The team came up with the name. We had logos and design. We also used it as an employment opportunity for adults in our programs. And when we came up with this idea, someone who had been supporting our community had offered a $100,000 donation to start the program, to buy the bouncy house, to do the marketing and everything. We had no idea that that was going to happen, but they were so impressed by the innovation and the idea. And this was a win that we celebrated often with our team because it was their idea, it was their vision, and it actually helped jumpstart a lot more ideas. And I'm gonna talk about the next one and that is Lay Coffee Cart. So there is a thread here, grins and giggles and that win led to the adult program team building a social enterprise called Pathways where the uh, folks within our program would select between a marketing track, woodworking track, cooking element to come up with a new business and their business was Le Coffee Cart. So they did everything in the program. They made Belgian chocolates, they had waffles, they ground and roasted uh, and uh, uh, prepared the coffee. The cart has been to community events. This is obviously pre-COVID. Community events at fundraisers, they had folks that did all the marketing. They created the logo. We actually had community partners help us with the woodwork and metalwork, which is all new ambassadors now for our mission. And I can tell you that there was as much happiness and pride when that launched with the staff who helped see that happen as there was with the individuals that were doing the work for Lake Coffee Cart. 
And, and we're really proud of that project and we've expanded on that. Uh, another one was around uh, internship recruitment. So we went out to a lot of our local colleges and universities to develop an internship pipeline. There was a lot of resistance in the beginning uh, because I think most staff and managers thought it would be a time drain, not a benefit. We, pre-COVID, were averaging well over two dozen interns every summer. We had interns reach out from USC, from Tulane, from University of Michigan, along with local uh, universities, colleges, uh, Sac State, we had somebody come down from that. And what the interns ended up delivering was a lot of enthusiasm, excitement for our mission. And they had to leave a leave behind project where they would give a presentation to some managers, including myself, on an idea they had about how we can make our programs better. Uh, and I will tell you the quality of the internship work and the support from the staff faded from resistance to they want more interns helping out because they have a very impactful difference um, on our programs and it's a new hiring pipeline. We started with rec therapists to help modify our program from San Francisco State. We now have a master degree rec therapist that's providing practicum work for three rec therapy students still at San Francisco State, making a marked difference in uh, program quality. And last is community collaboration. And this is about sharing our, our events and meeting space with others. We made a, a, a very bold statement several years ago that we'll share what we have. Um, and obviously there are some limits within that, but the one that is most significant that we just did, we had an opportunity to open two co-op homes, beautiful homes side by side for 10 individuals to live independent living program in San Mateo. We could have done it alone, but we worked with the provider of the homes. We said we wanted to partner with someone who already operates a housing program. We partnered with Parka, which is right up the road from us, to create a partnership in bringing these homes online for the individuals we serve. We will provide ILS and employment if we're selected to do that. Parka provides the uh, uh, interviewing as well as the uh, working with the clients living in the home. And uh, GGRC bent over backwards to work with us to find out how to structure this unique arrangement in, uh, in, our, uh, in their catchment area because it had not been done before. So there was a lot of challenges along the way. It took well over a year to get that agreement done. We now have four individuals in the home. We should be full by the end of June. But it was important for, our, for all of us to find new ways to partner and not be so precious about everything we do because ultimately at the end of the day, we're here to serve others. And so there was a lot of innovation, a lot of people working hard to make that happen. And now we're gonna have 10 individual, individuals that have, that have their own private bedroom own private bathroom in two beautiful homes. So we're excited about that. These all were just different innovation change projects that happened to where now it's a lot more self-fulfilling and team generated. And it meant that when COVID started, you know, I think we all felt a shock to the system when that, when that happened. But we were able to adjust a little bit faster. We moved almost 200 clients from therapy, clinical therapy programs, to teletherapy in two weeks. And so I think if we can build up kind of that skill set, it has a, a huge difference on the emotional health for our teams, but more importantly on the services we provide the community. Next slide, please. So the key takeaways, here's the reality. Change is either gonna happen to us or it's gonna happen because of us. There is no, no avoiding it. I'd much rather be leading the charge on what we want the change to be and I think we have an opportunity and a responsibility for those that we serve to be leading that effort. And I think acting with a strong vision of what you want your future to be makes it a lot more, I think, enjoyable, but also it's, it's just much more invigorating to talk about what we can do versus talking about all the problems that we have, because those aren't gonna go away, but I think we can think about a better future 
And one that I was going to mention that was not on the slide is we were, we've had this vision of creating a um, commissary in a large commercial kitchen so we could have training. We serve a lot of the large employers uh, in the valley with the employment services uh, in a lot of the cafeterias. We wanted to have this large kitchen and um, we wanted to uh, also look at having ILS training, healthy food preparation, food selection for our day programs, really turning it into a major program. Out of nowhere, a funder came when they heard about that idea and was willing to fund the remodel of this very large commercial kitchen for us to use. And as you know, kitchens are not cheap to remodel. We didn't expect it, but they were so excited about that idea for the folks that we serve and the staff's vision about what they could do with those facilities that they felt compelled to help bring it to life. So I think that when you think about the future and a vision for the future, it makes a huge difference for those that we work with. It is uplifting for the families, caregivers, staff, and everyone else. And in this case, we were fortunate to have somebody who believed in that vision as well and helped bring it to life. Uh, and I think that may be the last slide, except for the quote. So if you're entrusted with bringing about change, you likely possess the knowledge needed to advance the organization. And you might have a plan, but knowledge is not enough. You have to bring yourself to each interaction in a deeply authentic way. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think certainly in what we do, that is absolutely the bedrock of our mission. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we're going to be happy to answer any questions you might have and, uh, and, and happy to share uh, the opportunities uh, that we've explored and also some of the things that we have not done as well at, and those are learning experiences too. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. And hopefully Jen can join us also. Could be on screen. Um, there she comes back as far as that. Thank you guys for a great presentation on change. Change is, I always view it as, it's what life is all about. Change happens every day. And if you don't think it's happening every day, then you're not looking in the mirror very often. So, but one of a couple of questions that, you know, popped up for folks is, Jen, you talked about originally, there were three big items that everybody should really worried about, you know, as the health, the economic, you know, those kind of pieces. And then you said, well, then we added in all these other questions. How do you sort of help people sort of corral the universe into things that they really have the ability to control versus things that are really sort of outside their control so that, that they're not, you know, panicked by, I have to go a thousand miles. How do I start? You know, what's that, you know, what do you give them as that sort of way, way to think about that? Oh, you're, you're on mute or you're not here we go. Is that better? My my first reaction is that the panic is a, is a valid feeling to have, particularly in this moment. And I, I think the second piece, we talk about how you can't control the future. There are too many uncertainties. None of us has that ability. But what you can do is think about what actions you can take to nudge the future in one direction or another. So when you think about your uncertainties, kind of grouping them together, what's most important for you? Um, for education nonprofits, for example, so many that we talked to were thinking about the, the federal election. And um, when, when really the state and local actions of their school board made a much more significant difference to their day-to-day -day operations. And so thinking about like, what's the right level and how can I influence that environment um, is often a much more manageable answer than we often start with. And then letting go of the idea that you're going to be able to control that outcome because it's just not possible. Brian, what would you say? 
Well, I it's it, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add to that. I think you covered it pretty darn well, Jen. That, uh, um, yeah, I think I think you nailed it. Okay, and so Brian, I mean, one of the things that you sort of alluded to, and I always try to figure out analogies, is you talk about change, having to develop and build it. So to me, it's sort of like a muscle. So what are things that you sort of incorporated or used to help build your team's sort of change muscle, you know, the ability to think flexibly, to look differently, and, you know, to some degree, take risk. And because change right. is often about risk. And so how did you sort of, you know, build that muscle for your team? Oh, that's a great question, Will. And, and you, you hit the nail on the head. Change is risk. And, uh, there's obviously a fear of failure and nobody wants to look bad if they didn't succeed after making a commitment to change something, whatever it might be. Uh, the first thing that we did, as I mentioned, is we had that innovation working group. We actually selected something to go do so people could see it live. They could see what happens if it didn't work. Thank goodness it did. But also letting people know that failure is okay because we're going to learn from a failure and it's going to make the next effort even better. And so I think communicating that and being real uh, really goes a long way. And uh, there's nothing quite like, if you want to call it uh, peer recognition for success, it's infectious. And that's where the lay coffee cart was homegrown from the, team, the, the, the adult program team did that on their own and put that together. And so that was a lot think? of work to put that together. They had to find community partners to do a bunch of the work with them for participants to be able to learn woodworking and metalworking and assembly, et cetera. Well, it does those other things you talked about. It sort of, you know, reaches into the community. It builds new partnerships. It builds new links. It, it gives people community resources they didn't have before. Exactly. So Jen, what have you guys sort of helped coach people that you work with in that arena? My first thought is always to, meet the team where they are and so what that means is that not everyone is going to get as excited as I do thinking about all of the contingency plans for the five different possible futures that you develop. For many people making it through the last year was it should be counted as a triumph unto itself and so with the organizations, we've spoken to around 1,500 in the past six months. We always tell the leaders to, to right size what they want to do um, when thinking about scenario and contingency planning. Sometimes it's a full-blown effort like what Brian and his team went through, and sometimes it's a 30-minute team conversation to say, if this budget amendment doesn't pass or we don't get this resource allocation that we are expecting, what will we do? And so being able to take it in those bite-sized chunks can, can make it much more accessible um, for teams and particularly for perhaps new managers or those folks who don't think about this every day um, in their day-to-day -day work. Jen, you mentioned the, the kind of vagaries of budget numbers and whatnot. So uh, we actually, for the last three years, have budgeted for a range of outcomes. And that is what we present to the board. Uh, you know, call it a high, medium, low. Sometimes it's related to legislation. Sometimes it might be related to a potential donor opportunity or a new program. But we, we baked that in three years ago, and it really... I will tell you, it came in handy for the COVID year, uh, though the range was much bigger than usual. <laughs> yeah, it'd be yeah. one of those, it's, you have the massive range out there. And I think the yeah. other one is, is you both sort of alluded to sort of managing change, but there's also, you know, clearly in your case, so the Billy Path, Brian, is leadership through change and how to sort of build not just from the top, down, but how do you build leaders, you know, at a new level? How do you sort of develop that next generation and or shift the mindset of your participants from being recipients of what people tell us I should do to being able to say, I want to do that. How do I make that happen? I mean, right. so how did you sort of build that into your, you know, equation of management versus leadership? The, uh, 
Again, a really good question. So we we put together a program about three years ago called Everyone's a Leader. And uh, there was uh, someone I'd worked with in the past that helped put together that program for us. We tailored it for our organization and our service sector. Everyone who starts at the organization, no matter what level, has to go to the Everyone's a Leader program. And it's really about kind of that personal accountability for commitment to self, I'd say self-investment and for us to provide, you know, the training and ability to keep growing. And so I think that starts with the mindset that we're gonna invest in you and we expect you to invest in programs. Um, and, you know, the, the, there's nothing quite like a success to generate more success. And I think when the team saw the successes of the smaller efforts, they were willing to tackle bigger efforts. And through that, mm -hmm. where they ended up landing, Will, was in building out this Pathways program, it, it changed the definition of what we do, where we, we are driving ourselves to be life coaches and enablers of fulfilling the vision and the desires of the people we serve. And so that's a lot of pressure on teams to come up with new ideas all the time about how to modify programs. We've now done four of those pathway programs. Uh, and each time they keep getting bigger and bolder because we're listening to the dreams that the people we serve have. And guess what? Their dreams are big and bold. And our job is to help realize that through how we uh, structure the, the, the opportunities for them. Um, so that's kind of where it's gone. And I think when you see that infectious success and happiness and joy, that it's no longer hard work. It's now, what's the next idea? Great. I would just add to that, Brian. I think staff feeling ownership over whatever changes are being made is incredibly important. And I'm sure all of you on this call know that, but I'm thinking about one organization in particular, um, they asked the staff who, regardless of level, who was interested in creating our return to work policies, right? Who, who will take the lead to do that? Because given what they do and who they are, that was really important for them to do very quickly. And people who you would have never have expected from who's on the leadership team and the board, stepped up and really led that effort because they wanted to have a say over when they were expected to be back, what that would look like, all, all of those different pieces. And I think what Brian said is exactly right. That success of that junior analyst coming in and, and leading a several hundred person organization through that, it builds on itself so that they feel ownership over the change. They feel like they have control over it. and you're going to be more invested in it if you had a say over what that looks like. That's awesome. So I have a, a question from one of our, our folks It really is from the smaller organization side where, you know, financial and personnel scarcity is huge. I mean, they really run in a much tighter and leaner thing. It's like, how do you start to get that change built in when they're, you know, barely keeping it with water? I mean, how do you start to, to sort of bring, you know, what words of you know, advice or directions do you point people in in that arena? Uh, yes, I think uh, we all face that at, at, at various times. And I, it's, there's an opportunity for volunteers in there and not knowing enough about the, the community where they're at. But I think, you know, volunteers can play a very important role uh, sharing their skills with a particular change initiative or wanting to get involved and be part of that. Uh, so I would turn to board members, volunteers, community organizations. Uh, there are other places that we can solicit support. Um, you know, again, for the, for the woodworking and the metalwork, uh, we didn't have anybody who knew how to do that. Uh, but somebody was willing to go out and ask, and, and uh, those two companies offered to help. So I, I would say look to the community for, for opportunities for them to participate. And I think with that is recognizing 
the, the right altitude for engagement. So if, if staff is truly underwater, what that might mean is that it's more of a conversation with your, your board and asking them to step up and lean in or other community members. But even having that 30 minute discussion that can give people some say and ownership so that changes don't feel as though they're coming out of nowhere, it, it can't, can't really be skipped. Um, so, so with one organization that, that we worked with that felt really stretched, around two thirds of the people opted out of participating in conversations about the future because they felt really overwhelmed. Um, it was a small organization, they had a lot going on. Um, and we tried to keep them up to date along the way so that they could voice their perspective, they could share their ideas. But we said, like, you made the choice not, not to engage. We still want to give you that option in case you see something that sparks your interest or, or helps you to want to be involved in this process so that it's not, well, I'm stretched this week, so that means I don't have any say over the next three years of, of what my nonprofit is working on, right? That doesn't feel right either. Very cool. I mean, the other one is I think that, that struck me was the um, Brian sort of went between the engaging the heart, engaging the passion of folks versus the theoretical. And I think there's a lot of time um, people say, well, theoretically, you know, I've been in the employment space for years. And if, as I say, frequently, if people actually got people jobs versus talked about it, we'd have a lot of people employed, but it's easy to talk about, but not, it's hard to engage. And so how do you sort of balance that engagement level and getting people up there to go forward with that, that change and really engage their passion for it? And what drives that? Um, all I can do is speak for myself, Will. So I, I'd say, first thing is you have, to, you have to truly believe in whatever you're embarking on. You, you have to know in your heart of hearts, this is the right thing to do. And uh, it doesn't mean that you have every answer. In fact, in nearly every case, you have only a few answers. And I think that as you work through whatever it is that you're trying to solve is soliciting feedback, talking about the vision, getting, you know, when people start to engage and saying, well, have you thought about this, right? That's the first door that opened for them to become part of it. And the more that you can do that, and move things forward, it's almost like the start of a river. It starts with a small little creek and it, it starts to build over time. But at some point it has to start. And I, it, for me, I think it starts with each of us individually to have that vision of whatever the topic might be that we wanna go tackle. Because uh, if you don't have your heart in it, I mean, like when you hit the tough stuff, it's like, this is not worth it. Yeah. And yeah. So go ahead, Jen. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's also important to recognize we did a study on large organization wide change efforts. So if an organization is really fundamentally changing who they are, what they do, who they serve, two thirds of the time, those full transformations don't end up taking place. They get stopped along the way. They, they, the challenges with getting the right team or the right alignment don't happen. And so I share that to say that just be, we're to, we're to, Brian and I, I think are both optimists. And so we're speaking about this from very positive terms, but I think it's important to recognize that, that the pull to stasis is really strong and that sometimes it's there for a reason. And, and so, what is it? Some social media company, they say like, move fast and break things. And maybe that works for some organizations, but I do think that being intentional and thoughtful, particularly given the communities that we're working with and the harm and, and negative impact um, that change efforts have had on certain communities, it's just really important for us to be thoughtful and to listen to those who have real hesitations about a new direction for the education nonprofit I'm working with, or um, don't 
think that we should do a long-term hybrid model or don't want to come back to the office. Like there, there are real reasons for, for the hesitation. And the, the biggest reason why we see organizations fail to complete their change goals or fail to launch, if you will, um, is that they try to dismiss those hesitations or concerns instead of truly taking them in, considering what that means, and being open to changing your change plans if that's what's necessary. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, Will, that uh, Sarah reminded me about, and that is for everyone, I, I put this on one of the slides, there are pro bono organizations that will do a lot of change management initiative work for you, as well as strategy. So Harvard Business School does one for free. Uh, Stanford has ACT. There's the Taproot Foundation that does it. I will guarantee you in Southern California, UCLA, USC, USD, I would imagine that nearly every law school has some form of pro bono work around uh, advocacy. Um, so I would look at the either business schools and or the law schools for pro bono support for an idea that you may have. Again, I put Stanford, Harvard, and, and Taproot in the link. I can, if you want to email us, we'll, we'll give you the links to their websites where you can uh, uh, sign up for one of their projects uh, uh, when, they have, when they have time. Very cool. Okay, as we're about to wrap up and do that, I'm going to give each your, your last 30 seconds. So what are the top two things people should think about and change leadership? Jen, do you want to go first? <laughs> Who you want? I'm just going to go first. Okay, if I, have my, if I have my two thoughts, um, the first one I would say is not to lock yourself in to one particular plan for the future. If you have a vision for the change you want to see in your organization, that's great. And I, I commend you on being forward looking. And you have to be open to either the external world changing all of those well-laid plans that we all have for the past 18 months, or members on your team and in your community having a different view for the future. And, and if you try to proceed as though none of that exists, um, that, that can be a real challenge. And in my perspective, isn't effective leadership. I, and then the second is to really act with urgency and agency as you think about the future. So urgency, because there is a need to act and to not be paralyzed to get every single person to sign off that they agree with your plan for the future. That the needs in our communities are exist now and there are multiple crises happening. So acting with urgency is important. And agency, because as I mentioned before, even if we can't control the future, we can influence it. And so my hope is that your work, whether it be through the change management within your organization or within communities that that you are really able to to see the results of your actions on the ground and and to push for that better future all while keeping my first point in mind about staying humble as you push for it so if maybe they're contradictory but i like holding to contradictory ideas at once brian great those are great, Jen. Uh, I think it's, you know, one is to, to the, the broad definition of sharing, sharing your vision and your idea. And in that sharing, you have to be a very good listener and you have to feel where people are at and you have to incorporate all of that in whatever plan you're going to implement. You, and you need to do it often. Um, like the one quote I had, you, you know, if people know you care, it's going to make a big difference because you're going to stumble and you want them involved and engaged because you're trying to do something to bring everyone to a better place. Uh, and I think the other thing is kind of perseverance. You have to be able to persevere. And with that, don't take anything personally because change is very personal and people will react. And uh, 
when they're reacting, make sure you again, go back to Sharon, you become a good listener and you really hear what they're telling you because they're giving you important information. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we have the ability, even as constrained as we are, to continue having a huge impact uh, on the lives of those that we serve. And that also includes all of our teams. And so I, I'm independent of this budget stuff. I, I'm very optimistic because we have a great group across the board of dedicated, passionate people doing this work. And that's powerful stuff. Absolutely, as far as that. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Barry. Thank you, Jen and Brian, you guys were awesome. And we'll let Barry wrap us up. Thanks, Will. And thank you, Brian and Jen. Uh, just a wonderful kind of framework to think about change and how to, how to make that happen. Um, really appreciated the resources and, and the thoughtfulness uh, that you put into the presentation. Want to thank everyone for attending today and invite you all to follow up on this conversation and keep it going um, on Friday with our lunch and learn session. Uh, it's more interactive, you know, you can ask questions, we'll be there to discuss kind of what the, what we've heard today in these themes and, and try to keep a, an open dialogue going. So that's a Friday, June 11th from noon to one, um, and you can register at the link on the screen. Um, also, just a heads up, we'll have the slides and webinar recording from this webinar up as quickly as we can at our resource library uh, at disabilitythriveinitiative.org. Uh, at that uh, website, you can also sign up for our latest email uh, updates, as well as make any requests for technical assistance. Um, so that's a kind of one-stop shop at disabilitythriveinitiative.org for that. Uh, and then just to uh, get you excited about our next webinar later this month, um, which will take place on June 23rd. And I want to say um, happy pride to everyone out there. Um, and our webinar will be on providing inclusive services to bridge the gap for the LGBTQ plus and disability community. So really excited about that. I think it's going to be uh, an excellent uh, training there. That's going to be Wednesday, June 23rd from 3 to 4.15. Um, and hope to see you all there. And that about does it for today. Just want to thank everyone again for coming. Thank Jen and Brian again for their excellent presentation and for all your assistance. Very much appreciated, both of you. Um, we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. If you have any questions, uh, reach out to us through the website at our email address, info at disabilitythriveinitiative.org or give us a call uh, on, our, on our phone line. So thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a great day.